But the main lesson, you know, that I will always bring to policymakers, whether it's the premier, the housing minister, mayors, focus on supply, right? We know the demand is there. We don't have enough inventory in the marketplace to keep prices within affordability ranges. Every ounce of their concentration when it comes to housing shouldn't be on shiny gimmicks, shouldn't be on new taxes. It should be on getting more homes built. Welcome to the Tom Story Show with Steve Karish and Tom Story, where we discuss everything real estate or whatever else is on our minds. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Tom Story Show, your weekly real estate roundup podcast. We, sh- we appreciate you being here. If you're listening to us on the audio platforms, I hope you're having a great day. And if you are watching us on YouTube, make sure to like this video and subscribe and join our growing community. We have a three-peat guest this week. I was just <laughs> telling Tim before we started recording, once you see me and Steve and you talk to us twice, usually people have had enough. But we got him back. Tim Hudak, we appreciate your time. Uh, Tim is the CEO of OREA, the Ontario Real Estate Association. And we've got a lot of fun things to talk about today. So, Tim, welcome back to the show. Yeah, Tom, Steve, both t- good to see you both. Thanks for having me back for the three P eh? day. That's well, usually I don't get a return appearance, let alone three. Uh, so I don't feel exactly Patrick Mahomes here, but I am honored. Good to see you both and really good timing. A lot happening in real estate regulation, getting more homes built that average Canadians can't afford. And our, our big policy conference, or our big conference coming up, a reality conference uh, very soon. Yeah. So I'm going to get to the conference in a second, but I just want to get your ge- your general sense. Now you're talking to realtors. I know technically you, you're covering just Ontario, but you're probably talking to people from everywhere. So what's the sense you're getting? Like, does it feel like there's life in the market? There's a heartbeat. Things are happening. Has it picked up faster than you thought? Like, what's the general vibe you're seeing out there? Yeah, number one, I mean, hope always springs eternal. To be successful in real estate, you know, I've seen in action, you got to be an optimist. You got to keep hustling. You got to keep building your networks. You got to believe that, you know, there's strong daylight uh, coming up around the corner. So I I really, uh, I I love that, that sense of character that realtors have uh, across our entire country of Canada, Tom. Number two, um, look, I, I, I think that, you know, right now it might be a bit of a head fake in the market, but when the running back does a head fake, doesn't mean that they're not going to go down that lane uh, at the same time. So mm-hmm. certainly what I'm hearing, you know, within from realtors within Ontario and across the country, you're seeing more buyers returning uh, into the marketplace. Supply remains uh, very tight. More optimism on uh, on uh, the ground level housing, less so on the, the condo side, commercial a bit. Uh, mixed. Um, but a lot of it's going to depend on what happens with interest rates and mortgage rates, right? So multiple mm-hmm. offers certainly back on the table. Does that mean we're, we're through the tough spot? I don't think so yet, but I remain an optimist for, for, for two reasons. Number one, there is such strong underlying uh, demand. And with mm-hmm. a sort of staring contest between potential buyers and sellers that ends, I think you'll see a significant increase in demand in the marketplace. And number two, Interest rates went up at a, at a record pace. They have been up too high too long. When you see underlying inflation, when you strip out mortgage costs and rental costs, basic inflation is actually in the band that the Bank of Canada wants to see it. So I remain optimistic that we'll see a break in interest rates and therefore mortgage rates, and that will really get the market going forward once that happens. Now, when we talk about multiple offers, and you kind of nailed it, it's pretty much happening with freehold housing, right? Semis, detached, attached housing with with no fees involved. The condo sector is still a little bit behind. It's it's building a little bit. It's getting better. Me and Steve have been talking about this a lot. You know, if we do think rates are coming down at some point, you know, a lot of people are kind of looking at the summer announcements, thinking June or July it might happen then that first twenty five point. If we're getting multiple offers in today's environment. Are we are we a little bit worried what might actually happen if they do decrease the rates? Or is this just like this is just Bank of Canada cares about inflation and anything else is secondary and they don't care really what happens? No, I definitely think housing enters into that equation of Bank Canada's yeah. uh, contemplation of what, what lever to, to pull. And I, I think there is a concern if they see a significant surge in demand, a limit in supply, and therefore prices going up rapidly, uh, that's going to make them more cautious around stimulating that even further. Uh, by by further rate cuts uh, after the first. Look, I, I don't think we're heading for 2022. Uh, um, you know, like a pace certainly better than than 23. 
But the main lesson, you know, that I will always bring uh, Tom and Steve to policymakers, whether it's the premier, the housing minister, mayors, what have you, focus on supply, right? We know the demand is there. The demand will come back to the market. We don't have enough inventory in the marketplace to keep prices within affordability ranges. Every ounce of their concentration when it comes to housing shouldn't be on shiny gimmicks, shouldn't be on new taxes. It should be on getting more homes built. Is is the tax thing just the easy out? Is that why that always seems like the solution? Like like Steve's laughing. We're like it is in BC. We just got a new one. <laughs> <laughs> like uh, you know, Tim, you come from the political world. Like, is it just what when you're sitting in those meetings from your previous career? Is it just is that just the first thing that comes on the table? Is like, well, tax will fix this. Is that really what they believe? Because Some it hasn't do. fixed it. It hasn't fixed it. So- some do. Uh, most know better. And that's really, you know, our job to keep driving what the real options are, you know, cutting red tape, getting development costs down, getting more land approved, rezoning in areas of intensification to build higher. Like the solutions are there. I know we'll get to them momentarily. Back to your question, Tom. I think it's more so the shiny bobble because they know you can't build a house overnight. And even if you could, you wouldn't want to, you wouldn't recommend buying that right. house. So it's easy to chase a shiny bobble to say, hey, look, we're doing something. And that tends to take the form of a tax or a market restriction. That is treating the symptoms of the problem, not the disease itself. And it can actually be harmful. I'll give you an example. Right? Hmm. So the land transfer tax is going to go up yet again in the city of Toronto. That tax is a housing affordability killer. That hmm. means you have to have cash on hand to pay the higher tax. Yeah, I recognize it's at higher price houses, but it has a cascading effect because you don't move up to that higher level you stay in your middle class home and it hits all the way down to first time home buyers. And, and number three, it has been demonstrated time and again that the land transfer tax keeps people in their homes. People in Toronto stay in their homes longer than anywhere else in Ontario because of that tax. I've lived it. So in, in uh, Young and Lawrence, where, where Debbie and I were raising uh, our girls while I was in politics, there were five couples, all with young kids, looking to get more space as a kid's group. We were the only ones that actually then moved up to a larger house and paid a significant amount of land transfer tax. The others, Tom, you see this in your own work. Yep. They stayed put and they put their money towards renovating because they don't want to pay $50,000 just to move a couple blocks away. And the end result, those first time buyer homes never came into the market Com. in the first place. And so like, I agree. I could not agree more with everything you just said. Right. And I'll just, I'll just throw the butt in there just to play the other side for a second. So we can have this conversation land transfer tax. I don't know what it was last year, but in 2021, we had that record crazy year. I think it was like a billion dollars came into the city because of it. I guess now that the city has relied on this, on this income, if we took it away, how do we replace it? Or does it need to be replaced? I, I've heard that like land transfer tax basically pays for our fire department for like the city budget. How do we find the solution if we still need that money and we had a deficit last year in the city budget? You get what I'm saying here? Like just to play the other side and not just all agree on everything here. Like, well, if we take it away, how do we replace it? Well, number one, you can actually, if, if people moved more often and you built more homes for them to move to, you're going to create tax revenue from the baseline transfer tax and from you know other taxes associated with, with real estate and the spin-offs, right? So you're actually sort of strangling growth with that tax in the first place. But my basic premise here, Tom, is having spent you know 21 years in, in public life, you know, leader of the official opposition, the land transfer tax is the heroin of taxation. Mm. Governments get addicted to it. There's going to be highs when you get the tax, and then lows when the market slows down. You can't build sustainable city services based on a tax that is so sensitive to the ups and downs of the real estate market, as we have shown. There are better ways of going about it. The bottom line is, if every level of government says they're engaged in housing affordability, they want that young family watching Tom Story's podcast here to get a home of their own, to start raising their own family and collecting memories, then they need to get taxes on real estate exchanges down and get supply barriers out of the way. And this latest one, too, in terms of a uh, vacant home tax, that's another waste of energy that could instead be dedicated to getting more homes built. 
I have never sent so many reminder emails to my clients, which is, by the way, as a real estate agent, a great way to connect with them and touch base. <laughs> but uh, but uh, for this vacant home tax, and I, I was complaining on a on a previous episode, Tim, about I took my family out for dinner on Family Day of all days, there and I are. watched and I watched people that didn't know that parking wasn't free anymore on Stat Holidays get tickets and just tax everywhere. Steve, I'm curious to get your opinion on something. So they just had mm-hmm. in BC, they just had a new flipping tax which I hope Ontario doesn't doesn't copy. But Steve, can you break that down for me? Well, you might want to start copying some of this because okay. uh, the flipping tax is in. It's another tax if you own within 12 months and sell and 20% of the profit goes to the government, right? Within 24 months, it's a sliding scale. And people were already not flipping homes because – the I believe the feds changed it to income tax instead of capital gain. So, but that that was just the shiny object, as as Tim kind of said. We hopefully you guys go down this road with us. Last week they just announced an increase finally since first time since twenty seventeen to the first time home buyer exemption for transfer tax. So finally we have a little bit of relief, and they actually did a bit of a hybrid between Ontario's. In here, so we now get. You know how it was five hundred. <clears throat> excuse me, five hundred thousand dollars, and you don't pay the tax. It's right now. Diff- yeah, they said it's eight thirty five, but it's not eight thirty five. No one pays the tax. Or sorry, first time buyers. None. No first time buyers pay the tax on the first five hundred. So every first time buyer is going to save eight grand, and then between five hundred and eight thirty five, you pay two percent. And if you buy something over 835, now you pay the whole tax. This episode of the Tom Story Show is brought to you by Realty Ninja. Hey, real estate agents, I bet you didn't get into the real estate industry to try to become a web developer. Realty Ninja will help you build a beautiful website for your business without becoming all techie, because me and Steve are certainly not techie. They'll set up your entire site for you. They'll migrate the content from your current site, and they'll take care of all the back end, switching the domains, all the things that you don't want to do, they'll take care of for you. Their team of in-house designers will make your new site match your current brand and help you stand out from your competitors. Best of all, Realty Ninja offers a free unlimited trial that lets you build out your website and they do not charge you until you're ready to launch. That's right, they're so confident in their product and that you're gonna love the website that you build with them. They will not charge you until it's ready to launch. They don't even take your credit card details. Listeners of the Tom Story Show will not only get an unlimited trial before you launch, but if you go to realtyninja.com slash Tom, you will get 20% off your first year after you launch. A beautiful, functional, and professional website is absolutely a must in today's real estate landscape, and Realty Ninja delivers. So go to realtyninja.com slash Tom for 20% off your first year. That's realtyninja.com slash Tom. And now, back to the podcast. So they've actually done a bit of a tax relief for first-time buyers, which I think is a good thing. So I'm hoping that is heading your way as well in the future because you guys do seem to copy everything we do here. there's a i can tell you we help a lot of first-time home buyers tim and i have this number ingrained in my brain eight four seven five eight four seven five is the first time home buyer rebate you will get back that's the maximum rebate you will get back it's not a rebate right it just comes off the top these days but like that's the max every first time home buyer we're working with gets the maximum rebate back that's an issue because when this tax was put into place, the average home price was what four hundred thousand across bet, Toronto, yeah. and now it's one two. And even if it's a condo, still a first time home buyer condo is a five hundred to six hundred fifty thousand dollar purchase price. If you want to live in the in the downtown core, and there's there's got to be something that we can do. Like when we talk about affordability, it's always like the conversation that comes up, Tim, is like the next generation. How does the next generation get into the houses? based on what is happening with with all the different metrics well can't we at least give the first time home buyers a break why are they not getting a break Uh, for sure for sure um and and as you gentlemen both know from your work the toughest part is getting your foot on the ladder to begin with right it's easier to move up than to get into the market and government policy should try to create that next generation of canadian homeowners we um we've we fought for that actually i was in government when aria lobbied for the first time home buyer rebate Mm-hmm. success. And then when I came out of government and worked for ARIA, 
under Kathleen Wynne's government, we actually convinced them to uh, double the rebate. And that's where it stood since. Home prices have gone up. What we're saying right now is we should actually forgive it across the board for all first-time home buyers. You can income test it. I think that's fair if you come from a really wealthy family and you're buying a mansion. <laughs> all right, maybe not. But for somebody trying to get in the middle class, struggling Canadians, we believe that would help them get a foothold in the market. And, and one final comment, if you don't mind, because Steve was talking about BC stuff. Look, you can design taxes all you want. It's not going to solve the problem, which is not enough supply in the marketplace. But here's the trade-off. You know, every hour that a civil servant has to spend designing this policy, so let's take the vacant home tax uh, as a result, and then sending out, uh, you know, across the website and messages for everybody to go and click their buttons and following up with people. And then, Tom, what's the enforcement mechanism going to be? Are they going to, you know, check our hydro bills? Are they going to talk to neighbors to, to rat you out? Are they going to check your gas usage, right? Like, all the resources spent on creating, administering, and then enforcing this act. Imagine if those hours were actually mm-hmm. spent to getting rid of some I 1970s know, yeah. era red tape that stands in the way of getting homes built, right? There's a trade-off. And every ounce of energy, our elected officials and the civil servants who work for them should be spent on supply, not these wasteful, shiny bottles. I mean, I can't say it any better than that, Tim. You just, you just nailed it on the head. I uh, I heard last year, like the first year that we did it here in Toronto, there was like just over 2,000 homes that were vacant or had to pay the tax or were people that didn't know about this and got hit with the tax then had to yeah. fight it. Um, I don't know, you know, and it's gone up, right? It was 1% then. This year, it's 3% of assessed value. So the, t- the tax has gone up. Surprise, surprise. If you look at how much time and energy was put into that versus how many people actually paid the tax, um, probably a bit of a lost leader. Um, now, one thing me and Steve agree on across the board is education. Uh, our industry, making sure that we are a public facing industry. We want to save people from three star experiences. We want to give them the five out of five, what they're looking for throughout the process. And the best way to do that as a real estate agent is to educate yourself and go to conferences. Me and Steve go all across the country. I go to the state sometimes just to learn new th- things, things that are going on. Oria is putting on a conference for the real estate industry in Ottawa on March 6th and 7th. And you guys have some like not just like big name speakers, but some like, oh my God, how did they get that person speaker? So can you kind of fill us in on anyone that listens to us that's in the industry that wants to grab a ticket? Um, can you fill them in on the event? Yeah, absolutely. Then I'm going to throw back at you, uh, Tom and Steve, in terms of who's your oh my God speaker on the list, because that's what we try to do, right? We, we, we set a stage with our reality conference, it takes place every two years to be the best stage anywhere in Canada to get a preview of where the market is going and how you can grow your business. So we have leaders in real estate in Canada, from the States, and investment, who you're not typically going to see on any other stage in Canada gathered together. It's taking place March 6 and 7 in Ottawa. You can get details at realityconference.ca. You can still get tickets. A couple of the events, a lot of really good networking opportunities, they're sold out or on the verge of being sold out, but you can still get tickets for the conference and maybe squeeze in. So I'll ask you back, Tom, some of your favorites, but check out all the details realityconference.ca. I want to give a big shout out to your marketing team because the email you you guys sent out that said magic in Ottawa, I was like, that is the best play on words I've ever seen for an email. I was like, what are they talking about? And I opened it. I was like, oh yeah, (laughs) your main speaker is Magic Johnson. Like that's insane. Like what going, I, I don't, I don't think it's you doing the negotiations, but that must've been a back and forth for a while to, to get magic to come. Well, I, I, I said this, Tom. Look, I said, Magic, I'm going to take you on one-on-one. And if, and if I can take you to seven points, you got to speak <laughs> at our conference. So I, I, I practice up. And, <laughs> Play a game of horse with Magic. Yeah, and- he, wasn't, he wasn't expecting it. I used to be good back in the day. Um, yeah, we, this is an example of, um, well, we have a lot of speakers directly in real estate. We yeah. also want to have uh, experts who are going to energize the crowd and give you takeaways that will help you build a stronger business. And while I'm a big basketball fan, uh, Magic Johnson is a highly rated speaker, very, very energetic, engaging. But what's particularly important is he's not going to just talk about basketball. He has been a very successful investor in businesses and in real estate mm-hmm. since leaving professional basketball. So here's somebody who's going to be on the stage there that will be speaking to uh, those in attendance at Reality Conference uh, about how to make those right investments, how to structure business, how to be an entrepreneur and meet with success. I'm really excited about Magic Johnson. I'm glad you are too. 
I um I didn't get to see it last time, but when when Clinton was in town, even my dad was like, "Can I go?" <laughs> and I'm like, "Yeah, uh, if you want, you can sneak in there if you want." Like so, so you're getting names that are not just like. And again, there's all these people I could name off that I know personally that are speaking at the conference. That I think are going to be amazing, but you do kind of get in this speaker circuit of of real estate conferences. You see a lot of this, the same people, and and good on you guys for getting a few names that are like, "Oh my gosh." Um, never seen them speak live before. That's really cool. Um, That's so- the whole the whole game plan, and I'll, and I'll add on to that too. Uh, Damon John. So yeah. Damon is is the man. Like here is an entrepreneur, rags to riches story. Grew up a very modest background in New York City. Got involved in the hip hop movement. I got a few years on you on, on you guys, but it's in my era for music, right? So he talks about the music and then how he developed from scratch, basically. His mom and some of her lady friends uh, uh, knitting and sewing FUBU uh, bland, uh, brand clothing. Yeah. And then his yeah. his entrepreneurial spirit, his innovation, and his just incredible drive to become an international clothing success. And now one of the stars on on Shark Tank. I'm really excited to hear his story on the stage, too. And he makes – I did see him in the States once. Yeah. He makes a yeah. fabulous presentation. I, uh, I always think about the people that are on Shark Tank, if just the rest of their lives in public, everyone just comes up to them and thinks they're funny and tries to pitch a stupid idea. I wonder I wonder how annoying it is. Like, hey, Damon, hear me out. Hear me out. <laughs> That'd be a good idea. Eh? We'll, we'll take three or four uh, volunteers from the audience to come you should, up. And you should do that. You, you should pitch. do that. Get them to make their pitch. Or maybe it's like a real estate tech idea or, or have like the prop tech give them a pitch or something. Anyways, thought that'd be interesting. Is there anything else about this conference that our listeners need to know? No? Yeah, I, I'm also, um, I want to call out the, the coaches panel. We had a bit of fun with the old Don Cherry thing on, on Coaches Corner. Yeah. We recruited some of the best coaches in Canada uh, and the U.S. To, to give their viewpoint on how to succeed in business. Because, um, you know, Tom and Steve, I, I'm sure in your lifetimes and our parents' lifetimes, we've never seen the type of real estate markets last number of years, right? The world shut down during COVID and then the real estate market exploded. And then mortgage rates uh, increase and the market slowed down, right? These ups and downs, a roller coaster. So how do you actually hold steady, build your plan, make sure you're building in good times and, and in bad? And we have a series of real estate coaches uh, from Kathleen Black, uh, Jess Lenevel, Richard uh, Robbins. We have some from Buffini, yep. all different styles. We'll each do individual segments, Matthew Ferreira, another one, and then a combined coaches panel. And you can see you know, who speaks to you or combine all of their wise advice to make sure you've got a great year and years ahead. Investing in business coaching is the best thing I ever did in my career. I've been with Rich for almost nine years now. Steve, he's the, he's a slower learner of the two of us. He's been with Rich for about uh, 15 Longer. years. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we've had, we've Kath- had Kathleen on Kathleen's as well. Kathleen's been on the show. Uh, she's there been a go. guest. I've seen Jess speak multiple times. You got the best of the best, and I, I – uh, couldn't agree more that having these people, sh- you know, talk on a panel is really cool because normally they're running their own conferences. They're the ones on stage by themselves and have them all come together. It's actually gonna be kind of fun to watch Rich be on a panel because normally he just runs the stage on on his own. So I'm uh, yeah, how you can take all that energy right into a panel and yeah. each have their own styles, right? They've got their own sort of vision of how to be a success and how to invest in in their clients. So this gives you a really good bird's eye perspective of who speaks to you and your style of business. I love it. I'm excited. I think anyone that hasn't already grabbed a ticket, we'll put the information down below. If you're in the industry, highly would recommend it. Now, on the on the let's come back from Ottawa to Toronto for one second. Okay. So there was a headline the other day that says Toronto gets $114 million reward. Like we won something. We've won something for exceeding Ontario's housing targets. Um so basic breaking ground on thirty one thousand six hundred and fifty. 65 new housing units last year. My question is, and this isn't to put you on the spot, Tim, but like, do we know how many of those were rentals versus owned? You know what? I don't know off the top of my okay. head, but those yeah. stats are available. Okay. They, they are counting rental, owned, they they count long-term care uh, yeah. beds. They count well, that so too. Sure we, okay. we could get that background. Look, um, uh, maybe I could tell you a, a quick uh, a story about why I believe this way, but my 21 years in, in politics tells me that the politicians follow incentives and need to have carrots to reward good behavior and sticks to enforce it um, if you don't. Can I tell you a quick story I used to use in politics? Yeah. All right. So there's one day a police officer goes in for a haircut in, in town and the barber cuts his hair and all that kind of stuff. The police officer realizes he forgot his wallet or his phone can't pay for it and apologize. The barber says, you know what? 
Don't worry about it, officer. You do a great job keeping the community safe. I always see on the beat, haircuts on the house. Police officer says, thank you very much, and goes along his way. The next day, the barber comes back to the shop. There's a dozen donuts with a little thank you note outside of the barber shop. Isn't that nice? The next day, the local reverend comes in, gets his haircut, does a nice job, realizes also forgot his phone and his wallet. And he says to the barber, I, I feel terrible. I forgot my phone. The barber says, don't worry. You give us good guidance, reverend. You, you, you keep everybody on the straight and narrow. You're giving back to the community haircuts on the house. The next day, the barber comes back, and there's 12 Bibles laid out on the porch, thanking the barber for his, his kindness. Next day, a florist is in the shop. Same story. I'll get to the punchline quick. Barber shows up next day, a dozen roses, Tom, sitting there saying, thank you for covering my bill. Finally, on the Friday, the local politician comes in, forgets his wallet, gets the haircut. Barber says, it's on the house. You work hard. You try to deliver for the community. You represent us in Ottawa. It's on the house. The next day, the barber comes in, 12 politicians lined up at his door. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to say the politician grabbed a rose and a donut and took off. <laughs> ah, that, that'd be a good one, too. So I used to use that all the time in my, my, my appearances and stuff like that. It still, still makes me laugh. I'm sure I've joked probably from the 1930s or something, but it, it just shows they respond to politicians. So the province has, uh, sorry, politicians respond to incentives. Yeah. Um, the province has set aside, I believe, for the 35 largest cities in Ontario housing targets. If they make those targets, they get funding for their priorities like uh, transit, um, you know, the local uh, arena, a new bridge, what have you. If they don't, they don't get the funds. We think they can go farther on this. Mm -hmm. But this notion is one that Aria had suggested for years. I'm happy to see it in action, reward good behavior, and then use a stick for those that listen to the NIMBY forces and close their doors. I was, um, I forget who was it. Oh, it was Devel Morrison that was on the podcast. And she brought up the fact that, you know, when she's walking around in the Danforth area, just looking at everything. And like, t I moved to the beaches a year ago, so I see this as well. And when I'm driving down Queen Street, like everything kind of stops at maybe six stories because there's houses all around it. It's residential. But if you look at most of the neighborhoods outside the core, it's low rise on everything. And, and we can say that's NIMBY or that's just keeping the community the way that it is, whatever you want to say. Is there a reality or is this just what's going to happen that we're going to get higher approvals on these kind of neighborhoods and people will fight against it? It's 100 percent going to happen. But does that not kind of solve it? Like there was they, they built a new condo beside the uh, the fire station in the, on, on Queen Street in the beaches. And I was looking, I was like, this is a beautiful building. They could have added 10 stories. It would have looked a little bit out of place day one. But if you then follow it. Um, is that a way to figure this out? Or are we just going to push further and further outside the city to build? Because even if you go east on uh, on Kingston to see what's being built up on Kingston, like there's condos going everywhere. Well, like, the bottom line is, yeah, I mean, the bottom line, I think about the GTA, you've got the, the lake on, on one side, largely the south, and then you've got the green belt to the north, right? And that's the government says not going to touch it. So that means logically, uh, Thomas, Steve, you're going to have to make every use of land that's in between. You already have infrastructure there. You want to preserve environmentally sensitive land. We don't have any solutions to build housing on the lake right now, especially in winter time. So it makes sense to intensify where housing is allowed. And let me give it an illustration here, whether it's the it's the beaches or North Toronto, Mississauga or St. Catharines. So picture that wartime bungalow. It was fine in this time, but it's really shown the signs of age. Mm -hmm. And in all those neighborhoods I mentioned, pretty common right now to tear that down and build a four-story monster home. And Aria, we say, that's your right. You've worked hard. You want to provide for your family. You should be able to build up as long as you follow all the all the safety rules, fill your boots. But if that same investor, Tom, wanted to knock down that bungalow and build a duplex or a triplex or four you know, townhomes that first-time buyers could buy, you know what happens to them. They go through this regulatory ringer. They, they get the runaround at City Hall. The NIMBY forces descend to stop that development. The lawyers come in. You're going to be out of pocket $100,000 or more just from process before they build a home. Mm -hmm. So the homeowner throws up her hands and she walks away. This is the hell of it. And who hurts? It's those four families that won't get in the market in the first place. So we say you should have a level playing field. Build up, God bless. But if you want to get that triplex or fourplex, you should be able to do so as well. And really, that will be the single greatest key to unlocking homeownership in our urban areas. We call it exclusionary zoning because it keeps people out. Make that change, and that will help connect more people with keys. 
Do you think, are you seeing this as a trend now or more people that are building because the new regulations, like, are they building fourplexes on, you know, what would be typically like a family neighborhood area of Toronto? Are we seeing it? Cause when I, I was walking this morning, just, I went down to the beach this morning, walked back up the hill and all, everything that was kind of into four different units was a very old home. Uh, all the new homes are just these like detached monsters <laughs> that are going to cost $3 million, not really going to help anybody on the affordability side of things. Is it, are we looking at this as like, okay, you knock down a house and you're going to build it? Or is it more just take the house that already exists and split it up into four units? Is there, is there a preference or is like at this point, it doesn't matter as long as we just find more houses? Yeah, I guess it's, it, 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 as long as it happens, right? Yeah. I, I don't think it, it matters. You tear it all down. It depends on the condition, the size of the property and all that. Just give people the right to do so. Tommy, ask if this is happening. Well, we're in early days. It was John Tory to his credit as mayor that got this through. City Hall in Toronto. We've now seen it uh, allowed in Hamilton uh, and in London. Hmm. Uh, Mississauga had a tie vote and Mayor Crombie had to come in and break the tie to finally allow for this to happen. And one of the reasons is happening, well, ARIA put this on the table. It was part of our recommendation to government. It was a key recommendation of the Housing Affordability Task Force, upon which I had the honor of sitting as one of the members uh, from Premier Ford's appointment, but also because of the money. We talked to the City of Toronto, 100 million plus that they got. This is one of the areas where the city, or the province is attaching strings to say, you got to get rid of exclusionary zoning, hopefully at the federal level. I want them to keep pushing on that to get monetary rewards. But again, I'll, I'll stress it one last time. That will probably be the single biggest difference when it comes to housing affordability in urban areas. Now, the new report that was put out by Aria, which I love to touch on because it's it's super in depth. Uh, we'll we'll put it in the in the uh, comment section, not comment section, but description of this video to to go through. Steve, you'll do that for me. Maybe um, <laughs> you send it to me. I'll send it to you. I'll send it to you. So it's the analysis of the of the Ontario's efforts to boost housing supply. And Tim, I want to just set you up on this. So yeah. The Ontario government uh, had the ambitious goal of adding 1.5 million homes by to the housing stock by 2031. And from what you had just mentioned to me, that to me would mean new home ownership opportunities, rental opportunities, uh, long-term care opportunities, senior, everything, right? Like it's all kind of bundled in there. Now, the 55 recommendations made in the 22 report from the Housing Task Force, which you are a part of, um, this is how it's broken down from the report so far, is that 18 have been fully implemented, 33%. Um, to me, as an outsider looking in, I'm like, that's pretty good so far. Um, you know, we always make jokes that politicians get things done very slow. That, that seems like a pretty good start. Major progress have been made on another nine, which is another 16%. So 49% are done or major progress. You've got to be pretty happy with that. Um, some progress has been made on 15 of them and 13 have not yet been acted on, which is still 24%. So from when this was proposed, the 55 items, are you satisfied with these results so far? Or is this a, ahead of schedule? Is this what you thought? I'm really encouraged, and okay. it's much better than, than I'd expect from governments typically, and I'll tell you why in a second, Tom. But I also want to reinforce that we need to keep the foot on the accelerator. It's going to be bold decision-making that gets things done, and some of the tougher ones still need to get done. And right. we'll get back to that, I think you mentioned momentarily. Yep. In the grand scheme of things, having watched this from being inside the Queen's Park and, and outside, Often you declare these big, you know, blue ribbon panels with all the pointy heads that sit around it. And I was a pointy head on this one. And they do this massive, you know, report like those old Britannic encyclopedias. And they put it on a shelf and it gathers dust, right? That's typically what you see. It's a nice announcement and everybody forgets about it. So I'm really encouraged. First of all, we wrote it in a, in a way that was very uh, to the point. It laid out step by step what needs to be done. So it's a thin paper with all the, the main points that you need. But the fact that they got 76% either done or underway uh, in the first, we did that in 22, that's, that's really good, particularly for government standards. The key now, strong spine, get the rest done and don't back down. Of the 75% that were complete, if you, how many of those, like of the 55, I'm sure in your mind you have like your top five or top 10 that are the most important to actually move things forward here. Um, of the 25% left, is it like the, all the important ones are there or did they actually hit some important ones in this first go around? They, they did a lot of the important ones okay. the first time around. There's still some other key ones left to go. You know, one example we talked about earlier, Tom, was attaching money, the carrot, to getting decisions done. So that is underway. That was a mm -hmm. major one. 
that I wanted to see done. The exclusionary zoning we talked about, building three or four uh, on a property, um, homes, yep. they, they've done part of that. They limited at four, mostly rentals. We'd like to see ownership. So there's another one that was key that's underway. We just want to see that pushed further ahead. By the way, exclusionary zoning is different than inclusionary zoning for the listeners because I know that can kind of mix people up. When the first time I read it, I was like, wait, you want to end that? I thought that was okay. Anyway, so it's it's exclusionary is different than inclusionary, which is condo buildings building um, more more uh, affordable outcomes for people. So let's go through now. Now, you guys have laid this all out. You said, okay, so far we're on track here. This looks good. Steve, look, the government can do something if it's clear <laughs> and they're told what Maybe. to do. Maybe. I mean, we'll we've had that. We've had that now in BC. We've had the fourplex, threeplex, fourplex, sixplex rule that was brought in. And the word from behind the scenes at the city level is uh, developers are applying for these. And then the infrastructure is just not there. So they don't. Have, so, for instance, we have uh, most levels of government going to all electric heat, all electric appliances, whatever. And so they need an ungodly amount of electricity to now each lot because we're not relying on things like natural gas or the sewer pipe isn't big enough or whatever the case is so this is i mean it's great to change these rules and bc's changing a ton of rules but something seems to still be happening at the city level whether it's infrastructure or other obstacles being put in the place like for instance if i'm going to apply for my permit and now the cities i believe is it toronto has to okay building within a certain amount of time or like the permitting's free or something like that well then they're putting in obstacles before you can even apply for the permit so like there's a there's still a backlog it seems every time uh, the the kind of greater good the idea comes down to smooth this out people seem to get involved and just screw it all up again are um our gas stoves still not very much like there last year there's this big craze that we're going to cancel gas stoves. Do you hear about this in the states? Like they were yeah. going to ban them? Is that still Cal moving forward? California they're banning them, yeah. Okay. Yeah, we we do not support that. It's happened in some jurisdictions. There's been threats uh, here in Canada. It would probably start, you know, as Steve mm -hmm. joked in in British Columbia of all places, but we believe in consumer choice. Uh we believe that's an alternative, right, to heating your home or your appliances. And I can talk more about natural gas because there was one of the examples uh, in the report that I put in that category, Tom, of what really needs to get done mm -hmm. that hasn't started yet. So let's start from from the first category. There's th three subcategories that hit 10 points. Um, so let's start with number one, reform the Ontario Land Tribunal to prevent abuse, eliminating backlog and allowing fines for unreasonable delays. So that seems like the, the stick part of the carrot and the stick. Um, so can you break that down for our listeners? Like, what does that actually mean to make housing be built? Yeah, think of the Ontario Land Tribunal as sort of the court where housing uh, approval process goes to be tried if there's a dispute. So if a municipality is holding up a development product that's checked off all the boxes in its official plan, for example, the Ontario Land Tribunal would decide with the municipality uh, or the builder, or it could be a neighborhood group who's opposing a new development in their backyard. So this land tribunal has really been captured by NIMBYs. NIMBYs who don't wanna see any kind of development, they're happy in their own home, and they don't really care what happens to your kids, they can clog up the system by using a lot of procedure and delay tactics and quite frankly, often frivolous and vexatious cases because they know if they can tie it up long enough, the cost will increase and those homes may not be developed in the first place, the builder will go somewhere else. Mm. So we're saying, okay, you need that. Somebody's gotta be the neutral judge, but if there are places where people are abusing the process, where they're simply there to delay, they should be allowed to be fined, dismissed off the top, or assigned costs. That's what happens in our court system, Tom, which enables then people to say, okay, are there really strong objections here? Then I'm going to go after it. But if I'm just doing it to cause delays, I may face a financial penalty. Hmm. So that's what we're calling for. You gotta have more people doing, more judges, so to speak, right on the tribunal. But for those that abuse it on any side, whether it's a builder, municipality, or local ratepayer group, they should have some skin in the game because they're delaying homes getting built. I mean, it seems to me like some people take this as a full-time job to try to stop any type of development. Um, mm -hmm. Don't know if it's an age thing or whatever, if people have more time on, anyways, we won't get into that. Okay, so that makes sense on number one. Number two, implement land use changes to end exclusionary zoning. So 
pretty straightforward, but that's basically just like let people build four units, three units on on every type of property across the board. Correct. Yep, exactly. As, as long as they follow the rules, local bylaws, you know, fire safety, all that kind of stuff, it should be as of right, as opposed to the years long process it takes today that are keeping affordable homes out of the market. Number three, modernizing zoning to support commercial to residential. This is pretty interesting. Conversions and greater density along the transit corridors. So this goes back to what I said about places near transit going up a little bit higher. The commercial to residential, there's been a lot of talk about this. I was at a conference, I was at Inman in New York not too long ago, and uh, and they had a full panel on what they were doing here to try to convert these buildings, but only a certain percentage of the buildings actually qualify. Do you think this whole work from home flex work going back, are we going to actually see office buildings in downtown Toronto be converted to to homes, to residential? You know, it's kind of funny. Price Waterhouse Coopers puts out, and they just did this uh, about two weeks ago, Tom. Their annual report on real estate. We we participate in that. Mm-hmm. And last year, one of the headlines was the return to the office. And this year, one year later, was hybrid here to stay. <laughs> <laughs> so <it's, laughs> that, can, that can change pretty quickly. But uh, the bottom line is, there is not really the class A real estate, but but mm. lower classes are underutilized. Plazas, by way of example, have a lot of excess space, and some are challenged. So there should be, in our argument, and was in that report, an ability to turn commercial into residential or mixed use. Now, is that going to work everywhere, Tom? Like you said, no, it's not going to work in every circumstance. But in our logic, some is better than none. And the city of Calgary has done a very good job of working with commercial properties where it works to -hmm. convert them to residential. I think this is a long overdue improvement in our province. So we have an example happening in Canada that we could look at and follow if we chose to take this seriously and look at this as an option to bring some more supply to the market. You got it. And, and Calgary was early in the process because they saw sort of the decline in, in investment in oil and gas. And as a result, they right. had excess commercial space. So they're several years ahead of us. Let's take what they're doing well and copy it. And there's something that we can improve upon. God bless. But there are, in those areas I mentioned, commercial properties that could be turned residential or mixed use. It will strengthen communities. And that should be some good first time properties or for empty nesters. Could we incentivize developers to look at that as an option? Because I I don't actually know how the math works on this, but to have a lot and build up and build a new building versus taking a building that's already there zoned as commercial and changing it to residential and everything in between. Is it just so much more of a headache to do it to a building already there that developers aren't, aren't, they're not like, that's not top of our list. If we have to, we will, but we'd rather just buy this lot over here and just start building. And so do we have to give them the carrot and say, Hey, over here, look, it's located (laughs) really well. You know, you could just change this instead of going five kilometers that way and buying a new lot. Right. Like, is that an option? Yeah. Maybe if I use that carrot to go along with it, that'll actually help us with our argument. I'll get that a shot next time sitting across the premier. Hopefully he likes carrots. Uh, (laughs) The answer, your instincts are strong, Tom, as they always are. Your instincts are right on that there is usually here some sort of incentive in in two respects. So Calgary does have a a granting program because it's it's not an instant conversion from the type of building used for commercial to residential to help defray some of those costs. The other thing we can do is sometimes municipalities actually fight this. Mm -hmm. And the reason they fight this is that not that that they're against housing, but they get more (laughs) tax dollars from a commercial or an industrial space. Uh So for every of investment, more bucks come to the municipality if it's commercial or industrial than residential. So that's the other thing we need to overcome to allow that kind of zoning to take place and that stress in our report. It always comes back to taxes, doesn't it? I uh... S- Sadly, it shouldn't, but that is a real life decision that some municipalities say because they stop the housing because they want the tax dollars even for properties that are vacant. Someone had sent me this video and it was saying that like, you know, if you make $100,000 and you live in Toronto, um, based on what you pay in income tax and what you pay on sales tax and then everything, like what you actually end up with at the end of the day is like $38,000 or something crazy based on everything. Um, we could we could do three hours on taxes if we want, but I won't bore the listeners with that. Steve would maybe like that conversation. Um, okay, let's get to number four. Uh, streamlining new development applications by requiring pre-consultation. So what is what would a pre-consultation look like? For tenant landlord or homeowner insurance policies, 
go to squareone.ca slash the Tom Story Show. Use the link in the description. Save $20 when you start your free quote right now. So Steve talked about this a bit earlier on that um, there's so much process that seems to be involved to get something approved. And even if you have targets for dates that must be done by by municipality, they invent new ways to try to get around it. So mm-hmm. this is an idea to just to try to get all of the issues on the table from the get go. So instead of a municipality making something up halfway through and throwing it back into negotiations, the set of the requirements crystal clear at the beginning. And the builder would also bring what their game plan is at the beginning. Just like in other parts of our judicial system, where you try to solve issues before you go to court, so to speak, mm-hmm. this would be an attempt to make sure all issues are on the table so you can't add on anything new to the deal down the road. Absolutely. Like, Why can't you go for your rezoning and your building permit at the same time? Right? Why do you have to do that in two different steps? You're like, I'm rezoning to go to this type of building, but you won't let me apply for the building at the same time as the rezoning. It's absolutely insane. Yeah, Steve, you nailed it. And for some reason, among the OECD countries, right, Western developed countries, Canada is like second last when it comes to approvals, just because of examples like Steve laid out. Last place, by the way, is Slovakia. Who a Slovak name? I don't know what it is about my people, <laughs> but they're actually beating Canada being slow. <laughs> and that's some pride. So, so that's the first kind of category we've talked about, which is the zoning rules in Ontario Land Tribunal. Now let's get to the actual lowering of housing costs, okay? So point number five is allow water and wastewater services to be pr- provided through a municipal service corporation. So I don't actually know exactly what this means. Can you break that down to me? What does that mean to the average buyer or seller and how could that change things? It means $50,000 potentially off the top when it comes to the cost of a new home. So let me tell you why. I talked about natural gas earlier, Tom, and and you and I are on the same page here to enable that choice. So in Ontario, the way we finance natural gas connections or hydroelectricity is it's paid through the rate of all users and over a long lifetime, like 40 years, kind of like paying down a mortgage. If instead natural gas had been connected to your home and you had to pay all the upfront costs, you're looking anywhere from seven to $10,000 more on top of a home. So let's keep that long-term financing, and that means the people that bought the home, the person they sold it to, the second or third generation over that, they all pay down the costs of that infrastructure over time. It works for hydro. It works for gas. So we say let's do that for water and sewer. The biggest charge for development charges right now in Ontario is water and sewer, and we have a system that makes you pay that right off the top. If instead we move to a model like gas financing and hydro financing where it's done by the users over a time horizon like 40 years, Tom, that would take fi- up to $50,000 off the price of a home if we finance it that way. And that's not just for you building your own home on your lot, but for developers building 400 condos, you know, that's that's going to add up. Now, is this, do we have an example of this? Has this been done elsewhere in, in other provinces or like, where did this idea come from that we know that this yeah, could work great, for great, sure? Yeah. Great question. When we were on the housing affordability task force, we saw they, they did this in I believe in the UK, a number of states, and, and some other provinces as well. And the secret is we actually do it here, again, with natural gas and, and hydro. So hmm. why do we have a different system for water and sewer that is going to last for decades, right? So pay it off over time. And, and really, we talked earlier about what's left on the table has not been touched. I put a big red circle on this one. We're talking real money coming off the price of a home if we finance it this way. It's funny that you, this kind of goes along the same line of what Brad Lamb said on our, uh, on our show. It, it's different because he's coming from the development side, but his whole thing was like the transfer taxes and development fees, in his opinion, as a developer, should be pushed towards property taxes because he does think that we should take a long-term approach from everyone as opposed to putting the burden on developers and the people actually trying to purchase the homes as opposed to spreading it out. So it's uh, uh, to me, it kind of sounds like that same sort of thing. Let's 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 remove this from the initial cost so we can try and get stuff to market faster. Absolutely right, Steve. The upfront costs, depending what region you're in, the province or city, can be up to one hundred and fifty thousand dollars before before the first shovel is put in the ground, and mm-hmm. that gets passed on to the first time home buyer or somebody trying to get a move up home. It seems like when we look at all these points and everything we said, to me personally, this is my opinion, has total clarity. 
it's like, okay, this, this could be done if we choose for this to be done. And this actually could make a difference um, and would, and would stop housing prices from going up so fast into the future. Um, I'm just hopeful that, so we're only on the, t on the first five. Number six is my personal favorite, Tim. And we've okay, already, we, we've already uh, talked about this a little bit, but let's just go in more depth. I put an exclamation point at the end of this. I added it myself. Abolish the land transfer tax. <laughs> so, I mean, like, are they ever going to actually consider this? Are they ever like, they just I, increasing it though right now? They're increasing they it. Increase yes, they did. Yeah. For the luxury homes, which is 3 million, which if we don't do any of these things, guess what? The average home in Toronto is going to cost 3 million in, in 15 years. Yeah. You know, I don't know. Is, is this possible? Is it really possible? I want it to be. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's certainly <laughs> a challenge uh, in in the short and in immediate term. But the Housing Affordability Task Force did take the job seriously, and we said we're going to put the real answers and not pull any punches. So this would actually enable a lot more people to get into the market because it lowers upfront costs, and more people will move. Because I explained earlier, the land transfer tax is a barrier to yeah. people moving to a larger home and opening up that entry level home into the marketplace. So, so, Tom, my focus here on a practical level would be what I said earlier. If we can't get rid of the whole chunk at once, I get it. Let's at least start with first-time home buyers and exempt any first-time home buyer of you know average or modest means from paying that tax on the first home. Yeah, like could you do it based on a sliding scale on income as well? I don't know if is that is that something that's been taught. Okay, um, that makes because there's so many Tim. We we see this in our comments. There are so many people that are currently renting a place at $2,200 a month, but they got in during the pandemic and they got the pandemic rent, right? If they were to get a new rental right now, it cost them $2,900 because the rental market's gone up. And they'd like to get into the housing market, but they're in this position that it's good now. And maybe they've saved some money. And then, but then on top of everything, it's like, oh, also on closing, just to get anything close to what you're renting, we need 10 grand extra to pay for land transfer tax after. Mm -hmm you've saved your eight, four, seven, five. So there's, there's gotta be something from a practical level to be like, help the people get into the market, right? You get, uh, 100%. And we have been successful before two occasions. We, we got the tax, we got expanded both to resale and new homes. And then we got the rebate doubled, mm -hmm. but housing prices continue to march on and higher. That tax hasn't budged. So while Aria says, we'd love it if this proposal got done, we recognize we all live in the real world, so let's at least start with relieving that tax for first-time home buyers of modest means. I think that just makes too much sense, um, which means it may never happen. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's too it's too obvious. Okay, um, number seven, lucky number seven, reform how municipalities collect and spend development charges. Um, I'm all for a, a great art installation in the city of Toronto, but uh, they seem to cost millions and millions of dollars, and I can't quite figure it out. Um, does this just mean charge less development fees, or or what, what the term reform? What does that exactly mean? Hold them accountable. Okay. So um, CD Howe, which I think is Canada's best think tank, uh, did a study in 2021 and showed that municipalities in that year collected $4 billion in development charges, $4 billion. Now, if they're putting that all into roads or transit or water and sewer, okay. Mm. But um, um, less than half of it had actually been allocated to any kind of infrastructure funds. Mm. So our concern is we're using that as a big piggy bank. There is no connection on how that money is spent or not clearly enough for many municipalities. So just hold municipalities accountable for those dollars actually being spent as the promise. And if they're not, then take them down. Who holds the governments accountable? Like, like, cause they're the government. I don't know if that's a dumb question, but like, how do, how do we, uh -huh. as a, as a, how do we say to them, what did you do? Show us, yeah. I, I, they probably have to release what the numbers are and how much they have and, and everything. But how do we say that's not good enough? And, and yeah, then and listen. No, we, talk, we talked earlier about the carrot and the stick and we did the carrot <laughs> side. But, yeah. I'll just make that noise. I'll probably get him, whip him into shape. Yeah. Here's one of the stick. What's, what, what's this stick noise? I don't know <laughs> what that is exactly. Um, but who carries the big stick here? It's the, it's the province of Ontario. Municipalities okay. exist under law because of the province. The province could say, give us your report and development charges. How are they spent or where will they be spent? You can put that stuff up on the internet uh, so people can actually judge for themselves how municipalities are doing. Give them a little bar graph, right? Yeah. 50%, 100%, what have you. 
Uh, and, and if they don't, the province has the tools to then force them to either give it back uh, or to spend it to get more homes built. The province has the ability to bring in municipal zoning orders. The municipality is uh, needlessly delaying a housing project to get that done. The province can change urban boundaries or official plans. They have a series of tough tools in the toolbox. So if municipalities refuse to carrot, if they refuse to let new people into the community, they close the doors and let the NIMBYs run the city, then the province has got to take those sticks of the toolbox to get houses built. And Isn't that crazy, Tom? Like it, yeah. it seems to be every time a tax is collected, it just goes into the slush fund. And it's like, if you're going to collect that tax for that thing, that needs to be a line item and it may not be spent anywhere else, but that's not really the way it works. And I think in, in places like where I live, like I'm, I'm in Toronto, you know, Steve's just outside Vancouver. We all complain. The people that complain about the condo developments are never the ones that are going to buy it. And, and Tim, I probably told you this. I've said this on this podcast before, so I'm sorry if you've heard this before, but my parents, my mother listens to this show. She'll laugh when she hears this. When we were growing up, they went and they picketed with, with signs about a condo development at the end of our residential street. Now, my parents and all oh, their yeah. friends live in condos. <laughs> so, you know, 20 years <laughs> later, if they didn't build those condos they were trying to fight against, you know, they wouldn't have been able to downsize to something comfortable. But it's, you know, it's your current situation. And I get it. I get why people have opinions and, you know, we get to live this life once and you want things to be good for you and everyone's looking out for themselves. But I don't know. Uh, the reality is that we need to build more. So the third category is more workers and new models of ownership. So number eight is increase the number of skilled tradespeople in Ontario. Does that come back to immigration policy and the point system for so who's coming into Canada? Or is that just making people that are already born here get into trades by incentivizing them to, hey, become a plumber instead of another pesky real estate agent? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's uh, some of each, uh, really. So if we want to get the homes built, plus the roads, hospitals, and subways that we're going to need to be a competitive economy and save people time and money, then we need more skilled tradespeople. Number one, I, I will take my hat off the of provincial government. They've done a very good job of encouraging more people to get into the trades, opening up more positions in the trades, and knocking down some of the complicated red tape that frustrated people from getting the trades. I'm useless. I, 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 could, I can't draw a stick man with, with, a, with a ruler. Luckily, I mean, God gave me the ability to talk so I can, if I can make a living out of doing that, because I'd be useless with my hands. In fact, Thomas Steve, I remember in shop class in grade seven, I built salt and pepper shakers, <laughs> things of beauty. My mom put salt and pepper in them. They couldn't hold a single grain <laughs> to save their lives. But like your mom, God bless her, they're still on the shelf, right? They're yeah. still up there hoping one day this might take. Um, but I admire those that do. And if any of us paid any kind of bill to get some fix up uh, around our house or the cottage, you see, they make good money. We're talking six oh, yeah. salary, pensions and benefits. So, yes, encourage more people, women and men, to get into the trades. And it's going to pay off for our community, but for them, for their own income security and retirement. And number two is immigration. Um, the point system, you, you nailed it. We encourage more people with university degrees, uh, facility English and French. Like, uh, I get that. But if you are a carpenter, uh, you're a welder, you're a plumber, you don't get points. And considering we need people to actually build things today, that's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. So give points to skilled tradespeople and bring them into our country. We did that in the past. That's how we built the Welland Canal down my way, how we built the hydroelectric Beck station, right? There's a lot of new Canadians with the skills to do that. It's time to do it again. Number nine is fund pilot programs that create innovative pathways to home ownership for first time home buyers. So we talked a lot about first time home buyers on this episode and finding ways to help them get in. What are some, what are innovative pathways to home ownership? Like what is, what does that mean? I know I've asked that lots of times, but I just want full clarity for the viewers and like, how do what, this is great. How does it help ho ho first time home buyers get into the market? Let me give you two examples uh, here. Uh, one is a current business we met with called Arboro, right? Okay. Arboro actually then does co-ownership in a home. So if you need additional funds for the, the down payment, they'll come to the table with you, basically invest equity in the home, and you pay it off at the end of the day when the home is sold. So Tom, if they came in at 20% of, of uh, your ownership, you had the rest. When you sell the home, they get 20% of the upside as well. You don't have to pay each step of the way. It's when the home gets sold down the road. 
But right now, there's red tape that limits that. Uh, the national uh, government's uh, regulatory bodies actually discourage this. I think it is a valid choice. When we look at a lot of their clients, they come from disadvantaged communities. And while the rate of home ownership is strong in Ontario compared to other countries, we still need to get back above 70%. But if you look at Black Canadians, Indigenous peoples, very low levels of home ownership, programs like this could help make sure everybody, no matter what you look like, has an opportunity to own a home. Number it's, two on this list, use government land. So the biggest landlord in Ontario is government. They have a lot of property that's either not used or underutilized. So can you convert that? Maybe the province continues to own the land, but the buildings on top get sold, work with builders. We did this in the 1960s and 70s. So we could do that again, targeted at first time home buyers and renters. In New York City, and Major Mayor Bloomberg, they actually built 160,000 homes <laughs> in New York City by way of examples. So they can do it in New York. Surely to goodness we can do it in Ontario. It's funny that you mentioned the government doesn't like the idea of uh, shared equity uh, with another partner because they've literally laid that out as an option for Canadians that nobody took advantage of. <laughs> like, the rules were too. The rules, the rules were, were just, it was, they, they've expanded yeah. a little bit. And, and I've had a, I maybe one or two clients that have taken advantage of it, but but it, it hasn't really been a, a real talking point. I've um, got a 9A for you to edit in before you sure. uh, go any further. It's already this. been published, Steve. It's too late. When you, well, they're going to do a revision. It's going to have a 9A. <laughs> okay. And this is the 9A. Fund pilot programs. Um, I would love to see some level of government invest in education, particularly at the high school level. For financial literacy and the benefits of home ownership, people have no idea. Kids don't think about it. The kids, I mean, I was just thinking about this the other day, with talking to my wife about uh, our kids' high school education, and like I didn't give a crap. But I remember one class from high school where we did business development, and it's probably the only thing I ever learned. They actually sat you in a chair, and you know, you went through a, a a fake job interview and that sort of stuff. If you could do that with the benefits of understanding compound interest, understanding paying down your mortgage, and what that means in retirement when you don't have rent. It is such, to me, a simple, I mean, we love spending money on education in this country. We don't know if it's used effectively, but it sure gets spent. Why not educate our youth? Because they're going to hopefully be the homeowners of the future and not the renters of the future. Man, you know what? I'm going to send you a copy. It's even my uh, my election campaign platform when I was running to be uh, premier of the province. That like almost every word you said was in there, right? To actually have financial literacy as part of our core curriculum, teach the kids about the risks of of credit cards, have them their own judgment when it comes to car loan. How does a mortgage work? The rule of seventy two. All of that stuff is going to open pathways to success. I'm happy to report that 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 idea that I had back in fourteen and you've had for some time. They've actually implemented it. So they are actually doing that in the province of Ontario. That's going to have a long run benefit. Yeah. yeah. I heard I heard that a while back. I did a video of that when it was implemented. Um, I believe it was grade 10 or above or something like that. There was something coming in in Ontario. I can tell you, I uh, one of my good friends growing up, he's a teacher at a Catholic school in Toronto. And uh, he had asked me, he's like, I got to get this confirmed with the principal, but could you come in and do a presentation to our grade 11s on on just all right. the just just the simple things, the difference between a down payment and a deposit, you know what, how the mortgage works, like how the amortization works, just like all the things of, of what they would need to know. Um, and so I'm going to go in at some point and do that. But it was neat to get that call and be like, OK, they're mm -hmm. actually starting to talk about this. Absolutely. Um, I uh, I didn't learn anything about that growing up. I, I fell into this and, and feel like I got a little bit lucky, to be honest with you. Um, but a lot of people don't. And they just don't know. Yeah, right? I remember I, my, my first credit card, right? When I was at the University of Western Ontario, I was like, I right, free money. Here we go. What a nice <laughs> gift from <laughs> Bank of Montreal, whoever it was at the time. And and that you're, Tom, that's awesome. And, and a great person I'm in the classroom. And just instructing young people at an early age, the value of investing in a home and property and how that pays off over time and how it works, that's going to be gold. So, so we won't take too much more of your time. We'll wrap it up with point number 10. This, this worked out perfect. Eh? I, I love lists. I love a good list. Um, <laughs> it seems like politicians do too. It's, you know, so we can just, <laughs> we can just follow it. Okay. Um, implement provincial loan guarantees uh, and support uh, for innovative ownership projects. Um, cooperatives 
Steve Steve hates when I bring this up because I guess in BC maybe they're not as well looked at. Cooperatives started in Toronto in like the what 70s or 80s and still exist in many different areas. Is that what this means or is this something brand new? Um, no, we didn't really mean it in that sense. And I'll get to it in a second. Just the, you talk about politicians in their list. So another quick story. So Debbie and I, this is when I was outside of politics, we hosted a, a fundraiser for a finance minister at our house. And uh, it's a nice cocktail party. We thought he'd say a few words and then everybody would mix and mingle and have a good time. And he said, I'm, well, I'm here to tell you about my 13 point plan. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, no. Number one, <laughs> what's your 13? And, and, and the dog in the basement, just so she wouldn't be bug- bugging everybody. And she starts howling, like point number eight, ow! <laughs> <laughs> and then the baby starts crying upstairs. It was, it was so funny. So the fact that we got through 10, I didn't hear any dogs barking, your baby's crying. So that's good. Um, big, big one here is really focused on rental, right? We need housing okay. supply across the spectrum that people can afford. And a lot of rental projects are so underway, particularly um, purpose-built rental, ran into financing problems in 2023 when, when interest rates went up. And the, the numbers just no longer added up. So some short-term help to get those units built is what we would like to see. Interest rates come down in the future, you know, you move forward. But honest to God, Thomas, Steve, like for decades, we were not building enough rental supply or homes to keep up with demand. So this is a bit of gas in the tank to get more rentals built. I think this list is awesome. And I really do hope that Toronto takes it seriously. Ontario takes it seriously. Ottawa takes it seriously everywhere, right? Everywhere that we're talking about. I really hope that we can implement more of this. And that last 25 percent even if we can get half that done i feel like we'll be moving in such a good direction and it seems like you know on all sides of the political spectrum we our ideas are different on the taxation and but we all agree that there's an issue here and we can all agree on like there's some level of issue and that i guess you'd know better than me it's rare for everyone to kind of be like okay yes um now it's the implementation of this and making sure this actually happens and makes a difference because you know i'd like my two-year-old to be able to afford to live in the city without necessarily just hoping I help him, you know, you got it. that'd be great. Significant risk that that next generation of entrepreneurs, of job creators, of workers who are going to get things built will leave our great province for other provinces or the states if we don't solve housing affordability. That's mm-hmm. the, the bottom line. And, and Tom, I really appreciate great seeing you and Steve again. If people um, watching want to see more of the detail, Go to orea.com, O-R-E-A.com. We lay out all of these prescriptions that we talked about and how to get more homes built. And we also have some important public opinion polling that show that people are on the same side. Mm. That for the first time that I can remember, there is a significant mass of people who want to see affordability issues addressed when it comes to housing. And it's right up there at the top of the list in the province of Ontario with affordability as a whole. I've never seen that. And a lesson to government is... Toolbox is there. We've got the tools to solve this. Just have the backbone to use the tools that are necessary to unlock housing supply. I think, Tim, third time's a charm. This might have been our best episode yet. I really enjoyed this. This was awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming back. For all the real estate agents listening that want to check out the OREA conference, it's happening March 6th and 7th uh, in Ottawa. Magic Johnson, my, my buddy Matt Leonetti is going to be there. I know he's done some funny skits for you guys. Uh, Richard Robbins, Kathleen Black. We go on and on. It's going to be an amazing conference. So I hope to see a lot of you there as well. Tim, any, any final words of wisdom to leave our, our viewers? Hey, three strikes. I didn't strike out this time. I'm glad I got a single there. It's great being back on. Tom, Steve, thanks for what you do to give outstanding, smart advice to prospective home buyers, sellers, uh, and investors uh, in the market. And also a great chance to talk about some of the big picture issues here today. I really look forward to seeing you uh, March 6th and 7th, realityconference.ca. You don't want to miss it. Tim, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, everybody, for listening or watching to the show. I hope you have an amazing week, and we will see you next week. Bye.